under the floorboard to prove anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I need, perhaps I should sit on a chair then. Yeah, I'll get a chair. Yeah. Well, we, when we had um, the Pure Gallery exhibition in the Real Turner Prize Show 2000, mm. Um, the paintings were sort of hung differently for different people, and all of Philip Absalon's were hung at angles. <laughs> so I wonder if you were following that person. Well, we're sitting here in uh, one of my very rare solo shows. Um, I think this is the first one that's I wasn't actually part of the promotion of it. The camera's moving around an awful lot. <laughs> I can read back like this, can't I? <laughs> um, so just, this is a show that just happened because of the work in the collection of you, Edgeworth mm. Johnstone. And I think it's the second exhibition you've done here recently. Mm. The first one was a mixed stuckish show, including Billy Childish and Joe Machine and other people. So this is the first solo show. You have got quite a lot of my works, obviously. And this is, this is not... I'm surprised how many you've got. Because I know there's a whole load more all hanging up the stairs, or there were. And there were early works done in you know, that kind of style. Black lines and flat colours. Oh, that, that's, a, that's a better example. There we are. Black lines and flat colours. Whereas uh, nowadays I will paint in much more fluidly, like the one up there. There's no black lines and there's no flat colours. And sometimes the lines aren't even as pronounced as that. Sometimes the lines disappear. And I think you've pointed out there was a kind of initiation into a new way of more flexible and fluid way of painting with that one there. Try not to leap round all over the place. Okay. It makes the viewer giddy. Doesn't it? I'll stay still I'm for a bit now. The, speaking to the viewer here. Yeah. The best thing is to set the camera on a tripod, I think. Are there any one of these uh, particularly personal to you? Oh, oh, oh dear. Are there any particularly personal? Wait, when you say personal, do you mean in terms of artistic or in terms of my own life? Let's say both. Both. Um, I know it's very hard to answer that question, to be honest. I mean, I think, are there any that particularly evoke? Not really. Not personal in my life, I don't think there are. Perhaps, in a way, that's the most personal one because it's the toy cat of someone I was in a relationship with. But, I mean, that's just somebody I met once and drew. Well, there was something about that one, because I remember I asked you about that and I think Paul Harvey also wanted one. So, you didn't you do two? <laughs> yeah, I painted it again. Right. So which one have I got, the first or the second? You've got the other one that he hasn't got. OK, I'll, I'll live with that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which was which. Who had, who had one first? I don't know. I They're don't more know. or less the same as each other, actually. Yeah. So it doesn't make much difference. Um, That's S.P. Howarth up there. Yes, I know it is, but... I, know. I, I tell you exactly where he was when that was painted. Mm. Actually, I'm working with S.P. now, S.P. Howarth, with poetry. He's really stopped painting, and he's doing poetry and acting. Uh, he went to Camberwell Art College and achieved the distinction of being kicked out of the painting department for doing paintings, because he was told it was an ideas-based department. And when he said his idea was to do paintings, he said that wasn't acceptable as an idea. Mm. And actually, I got him a, um, a story in the Times newspaper, like half a page, all about it, because, you know, such an outrageous situation. Yeah. Um, that's in the early days of Stuckism and SP, and it's actually around a friend's flat that was just off Tottenham Court Road, Hatteray, and she let us use her 
address in Percy Road um, because it was a prestigious address for Stuckism. And we, I think this was after we went on the demo in Trafalgar Square um, against Rachel White Reed's plinth. Because on the empty plinth, she did a, a full size cast in resin and turned it upside down and put it on top of the plinth, which was very clever and very stupid simultaneously. And we did a demonstration about that. Actually, Stella Vine was one of the participants, much to her chagrin later on when she looked back. And there's photographs of it, a press agency, I think it's Getty Images. One of them has got photographs of her standing there with her stuckest placard, but she can't deny it. And um, when I wrote a, an essay for the Stuckist Punk Victorian book for the Walker Art Gallery in um, what was that, 2004, we had a big show there, which went on for five months. The first section of my essay was called The Battle of Trafalgar, because it was describing this event which took place in Trafalgar Square. It was an opening event. There was all these celebrities like Melvin Bragg and Nicholas Sirota and some artists and there was um, a normal crash barrier for the uh, public to stand behind where we were standing. So the ceremony was over and the people, had, you know, it had been unveiled, people had got off the plinth where the microphone was and I thought well, this is too good an opportunity to miss. And I don't like doing these kind of things, but I thought, well, I have to do this. It's my duty. So I climbed over the top of the crash barrier, got on the plinth, and started addressing the crowd through the microphone <laughs> about the shortcomings of the Turner Prize. <laughs> and all these celebrities were standing there listening. They didn't, have <laughs> they didn't have any option until somebody had the bright idea, eventually, after I'd been speaking for two or three minutes, of actually turning the power off. And it was, it was a videoed as well, it was on a, some kind of um, cable TV arts programme, I think. And then afterwards, I was in the crowd, and suddenly I saw this figure coming towards me, like a destroyer approaching a submarine. And it was Sir Nicholas Sirota, who was somewhat irate. And he said, he was very disgusted, because he said I had used somebody else's work. For my own purposes and I was quite a bit taken aback but I thought well I'll, I'll use an art historical reference because that might placate him because <laughs> he didn't look very happy and I said it's Dada <laughs> and he kind of I can't remember what he said exactly it's in the book that basically he kind of snorted and stormed off again <laughs> and there's a nice photograph of him and me together having our interaction now Wait for it, wait for it, wait for the absolute total hypocrisy. Recently, and we're now in uh, August 2022, I think it was a week or two ago, and so it's still available on YouTube, they repeated, and, and uh, BBC repeated on iPlayer, an Alan Yentob documentary about Cornelia Parker. And in the middle of this, or towards the end of this documentary, it got on to one of her works where she had wrapped Rodin's The Kiss statue in a mile of string. I think it was a mile. Anyway, loads of string, possibly a mile, because that was the amount of string that Marcel Duchamp wrapped up a, an exhibition in the Dada or Surrealist exhibition, like cobwebs, like strings everywhere. So I think that's why she maybe used a mile of string. Um, well, hang on a moment, isn't she using another artist's work to promote her own work? Which is exactly the accusation that Sirota had levied at me with such vehemence and outrage, and now he's letting, because he was in charge mm. of the Tate, he's letting somebody else do exactly the same thing that was so bad when I did it. So that strikes me as being double standards. Actually, what happened on this Yentop documentary, and... Um, was that the Stuckies came into it because there was a Stuckies demonstration. Now I have to say I didn't know anything about this at the time and neither did anybody I know but apparently this Stuckies, and I later found out it was someone called Pierce Butler who had founded the Nothing Else Stuckies because all the Stuckies groups are independent, they do what they want 
So it's nothing to do with me, but he, on his own volition, had gone in, he'd got lots of couples standing around the kiss, kissing each other, while he started snipping the string off. Um, so that was another Stuckist demonstration, which we got publicity from, which was nothing to do with us. Well, I say us, nothing to do with me, because I usually am involved with Stuckist things. I don't have to be, but I usually am. Um, that's quite funny. It's like when Tate Modern opened, um, somebody did some kind of demo, which people were attributing to the Stuckist, or thought it was the Stuckist doing it. And so we got publicity for not even doing a demo, or someone else doing a demo. <laughs> which, of course, we had done lots of demos, or we, we, we were about 20 years worth of demos outside the Turner Prize. Um, and when people were so familiar and so used to us doing demos that one year we didn't do a demo and the Telegraph reported the Stuckists weren't demonstrating. <laughs> and then another year we turned up and said, we turned up and said we weren't demonstrating and handed out leaflets explaining we weren't demonstrating because it was so bad we couldn't be bothered to demonstrate, which I thought was a, an amazing piece of sort of ironic sort of conceptualism, the fact that we were handing out leaflets saying we weren't demonstrating. My, my ideal, my dream, was always that, that our Turner Prize demonstrations would be nominated for the Turner Prize, so we could have the demonstration actually inside the Turner Prize as one of the four nominees. Well, meanwhile, outside, we were demonstrating against the fact that we were nominated for the, the Turner Prize. <laughs> but this sort of thing doesn't seem to get through, it doesn't appeal to they them. They wouldn't think of that. That's it's, too good. It, it's too good. Mm. Um, I mean... What amazes me is that if you say, I'm part of the art establishment, I think you're wonderful, and I'm doing this kind of wacky thing, they say, oh, it's so wacky and funny and ironic and clever. If you're ex exactly the same thing with exactly the same mentality, but say, I don't think you're wacky, I think you're a load of wankers, and I think, well, you're talking out your ass," then they say, oh, it's pathetic, it's infantile. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can, oh, yeah, because... Um, there was a bit of a run-in with Sarah Kent, who was the art editor of Time Out, because she wouldn't feature any of our shows. And a journalist rang her up and said, and she said, oh, well, we can only feature one in four shows. And the journalist said, well, they've got five opening tomorrow. And we made a fuss about it. It was great, because it got in the evening standard that the Time Out is censoring the Starkist. Which is, we just get better publicity than if they'd actually reviewed mm. us. So I think that rather pissed off the editor, because the next thing, Sarah Kent was turned up, was sort of forced to review our shows, and obviously tried to rubbish them. And she said that I'd obviously be looking, because she talked about my painting of Sir Nicholas Sirota behind a large pairing of red knickers, and the speech bubbles in the painting saying, is it a genuine M in? or a worth £10,000, or a worthless fake, or imitation, or something, worthless fake. Um, with this pair of red knickers, to do with the fact that Tracy Amin had exhibited her bed with knickers and stuff around it. And Sarah Kent said that, and this was a sort of pure or infantile, or whatever, humour. Well, a few weeks after that, Tracy Amin was on television complaining that uh, um, an installation that someone was exhibiting did not contain her genuine knickers. <laughs> they were substituted for another couple of pairs of knickers. So I felt from being a pure art, it was quite prescient, it was prophetic. It's actually what happened. Mm. So if what I did in saying that in the painting is a pure art sense of humour, isn't what Tracy Emin then did equally as pure art in reality? Mm. Um, and another thing, she said, I'd obviously been studying the work of Michael Craig Martin. Well, first of all, I mean, I'd never seen Michael Craig Martin's work originally when I started working like this because he wasn't around. I mean, Patrick Coalfield was around, uh, Lichtenstein was around, and actually my original use of black lines um, was based on cloisonism, which was the use of outlines and flattish colours in the 19th century by Van Gogh and Emile Bernard and later by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner of Die Brücke of German Expressionist from about 1905. That was my inspiration, certainly not Michael Craig Martin. Um, and the other thing was, hang on a moment, because one of my 
early uh, paintings of Stuckism. Um, actually, I'd done it. No, I'd actually done it at art college. In when I was there at Mason Art College, so we're going back to 1978. I'd done um, Cyril's Bathers painting in black outlines and flat colours, so the men in it. I mean, it's a group of men by the river. Um, it's in the National Gallery. So the man, it was one with white coat, I just left it white. Anyway, it's flat, black outlines and flat colours, which I then repeated later because someone wanted a copy and I didn't have one, so I painted it again. Now, when Stuckism was launched um, in 1999, and it featured on the cover of the Sunday Times Culture, and there was a page and a half inside, it had a big reproduction of this painting I'd done of Cyril's the Bather with black outlines and flat colours. Well, a few years later, I think it was a Sunday Times again, featured Michael Craig Martin doing a version of Cyril's the Bathers with black outlines and flat colours. So hang on, who's been looking at who? And as far mm -hmm. as the kind of jelly drop colours that he uses, those kind of bright, bright pinks and yellows and reds and stuff, again, I've got paintings where I'd use these same colours in 1978 at our college. That was just way before, as far as I know, he was doing that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And I got those colours from punk art, from the, the Sex Pistols, never mind the bollocks, yellow and pink fluorescent pink album cover because that was the kind of colours that were around with sort of punk visuals it was like fluorescent greens and pinks and yellows and that's where I got those colours from um, I don't know why I'm saying all this apart from the fact that why the hell not because some people might find it vaguely, you seem to be finding it you being Edgeworth, the man behind the camera seems to be finding it quite entertaining yeah, um, yeah. I think there's so many entertaining things in Stuckism Mm. I mean, we ought to do a whole book of uh, entertaining things. Mm. There's another classic one, but um, again, this was when Billy was with the Stuckist. Now, he seems to think he was with the Stuckist for six months. It was actually 30 months, if you want to know. It was from January 1999 right up to July 2001 at the Vote Stuckist show at the Fridge Gallery. That's where he told me he was leaving. That was 30 months, actually. Perhaps he's not very good at maths. Or perhaps he wishes it was only six months. Actually, he probably wishes it was no time at all. But he does like the manifestos. Well, he half wrote them. You know, we co-wrote them. And he, he's always liked... It's kind of weird, someone who doesn't like Stuckism, but really likes the Stuckist manifestos. Doesn't matter anyway. I suppose he thinks Stuckism wasn't a manifestation of the manifestos. But it's actually meant to be the other way around. It wasn't that the artists were meant to come along, read the rules and then conform. It was meant, we were meant to be looking at what the artists were doing and then trying to put that into some kind of manifesto. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But it was when Billy was still in the Starkist, so it was the early days probably. It was probably about 2000. And the Journal do Brasil, the Journal of Brazil, the uh, you know, national Brazilian newspaper, decided to do a... Um, article on the Stuckists and phoned up the British Council. Now the job of the British Council is to promote British culture abroad. So you'd have thought, great, you know, a national paper in Brazil wants to feature British artists. Um, these are rebel artists, so let's say it demonstrates the plurality, the tolerance of our society and our culture, that we have a country where we have an opposition group that's quite vociferous, quite rude, about the establishment, about national figures, about the director of the Tate Gallery, and this is part of our culture, and this is what democracy is, this is what free speech is, and this is Britain, good mm. old us, you know, we're not like these bloody repressive regimes that stop people and squash them and don't let them speak. Well, that's what I would have said if I was this person in the British Council. So what did she, what did she say? Oh, you shouldn't do anything on them. Mm. Uh, oh, wonderful, what a good example. Um, no, you shouldn't do anything on them. They're, they're not worth doing. I can't remember the exact reason, but you definitely shouldn't do anything on these people. You know, they, they're not good people, <laughs> mm. something like that. 
And furthermore, furthermore, there's only two people doing it. They've painted all the paintings between them and they've made out these fictitious names like Wolf Howard and Joe Machine. They're obviously not real names. They've made them up and it's just these two people doing this whole scam. Mm. Anyway, I told Joe, Joe Machine that someone had thought I'd made him up. And he didn't, wasn't terribly impressed by that. Well, the thing is, if you say to a journalist who wants to do an article, you shouldn't do this article, you might just as well, you couldn't think of a better way of encouraging the journalist to do the article. Furthermore, you're likely to end up getting quoted in the article, which mm -hmm. isn't going to be for... So this is a complete ineptitude. That's what gets me. It's not just they're doing this, they're doing it badly. Mm. Um, and there was a great article. Yeah, it was a big article about the circus, yeah. and possibly about how we, they shouldn't do something on the circus. Mm. And another classic example is um, the whole scandal over the Tate's purchase of its own trustee's work, Chris Ophelia, and they bought his work. And it was announced in the... It, that, that wasn't announced in the press. What was announced in the press was, oh, the Tate is buying this important installation called... What's it called? The Last Supper or something? Um, based on Christ's Last Supper except Chris Ophelia had painted all the disciples as monkeys. It's a good job he's black, isn't it, and not white. Because, mm. yeah, you know, and that's something that really gets up my nose. I mean, believe in equality. Mm. But I believe in equality for white people as well as black people and yellow people, purple people, and, and people who are green with um, red stripes. Mm. And that really gets up my nose when, you know, you've got to get out of jail free card if you happen to have certain qualifications which I won't go into now, because you're probably not allowed to say, is it? There's this stifling of free speech. Mm. And our democracy, our whole culture, is based on freedom of speech, um, for debate, for progress. And people have fought and died for that mm. privilege, for that right. Nazis obviously did not want people to, did not allow people to have free speech. Mm. Um, you couldn't dissent. And if you did, you know, you ended up in a concentration camp. Yeah. And my relatives were involved in opposing the Nazis. You know, their youth was spent in my own, one uncle's in the 14th Army in, in Burma, said he saw horrendous things. Another mm. one was flying planes, uh, cargo planes. 13 set out, and his was the only one that arrived. Mm. My mother was on anti-aircraft guns in the end of the war. I mean, the only plane they shot at turned out to be an American, but fortunately they missed. Mm. But, you know, she'd got, she'd got veterans' badges. She was in uniform. Mm. My father was preparing in a, to invade Japan in a tank, um, and so on. So, you know, my very, very immediate family fought and were prepared to give their lives mm. to oppose tyranny. Mm. And of course, it starts out insidiously um, with people being criticised in the press. This all happened in Nazi Germany, and then they were sort of forbidden to speak. And it didn't happen overnight. It happened as salami tactics. You cut off one slice at a time. You, you, you do a protest against them. You have a gang. You ostracise them. You criticise them. You stop them books coming out. You stop them from speaking at universities, you get them dismissed from their post at universities. Well, hang on a moment, this is sounding rather familiar, because it's exactly what the Nazis did. Mm. I'd just like to point that out, in case anybody's listening. If you're actually using this tactic to stop someone whose opinion you don't like or you don't approve of, that is exactly the tactic that the Nazis had. Mm. And it obviously escalated. Because um, when people want to make a point, when they want a change in society, it tends to escalate because they can't achieve that change immediately. It's not going to happen overnight. That happened, well, actually it happened with the suffragettes because they started, when they didn't get what they wanted straight away, they started doing violent things, slashing pictures, the Rugby Venus and National Gallery. Then a woman threw herself in front of a horse uh, during a horse race and was killed. Then they started 
posting bombs. One of went through a letterbox in Gravesend, as it happened, was defused by a gallant sergeant of police. Bombs! Well, actually, if they just hung on a bit, waited, it all happened during the First World War because the country needed women in men's jobs and then the, it changed the balance, it changed the dynamic. History changes things anyway. If you're patient, you're, it will happen. The same thing happened in the 60s, and I, I was part of that. Um, you know, start a peace and love, you want to change society, you want to get away from a materialistic society, you want to bring in different ideals, maybe spiritual ones, maybe, you know, peace and love, and it sounds corny and stuff, but I mean, perfectly valid, isn't it? I mean, the whole of Christianity, or most, a lot of it was based on, a lot of it was based on something else with the Inquisition and the Crusades, but actually, what we think of as Christianity is peace and love, and so, generally, that's not derided, Whereas hippies are for some reason, I don't know exactly why. Perhaps they should have dressed up as bishops. And mind you, they did dress up looking not much different to bishops. <laughs> um, but they wanted ideals, they wanted to change society, they wanted to change certain things about it. And again, there was this frustration because it wasn't happening overnight. And it started becoming increasingly agitated. And I was taking part, I started taking part in demonstrations. And there was the angry brigade that actually were um, using bombs or planning to, I think they might have planted a bomb, but certainly they were involved with that, uh, that was their solution. The same thing turned to violence, you turned to more extreme measures. Well, that does seem to be happening with the movements now, which of various kinds addressing valid issues. I'm sure, you know, I have no doubt that um, Black people have an inadequate time in our society. Um, There's a rather interesting Evening Standard article in Brixton. It one went down one street was all the white people, another street a lot of black people. All the white people were saying the police are great. All the black people were saying, look, they come in and invade our house every other day. You know, we're a perfectly respectable family. So, you know, I've no doubt that black people. There's racial prejudice. Yeah, sure. Um, and I've no doubt that people with gender issues, um, you know, transsexual issues and so on, have a bad time, which they shouldn't have. They should be perfectly free to be respected, you know, and, and, and so on. In fact, one of the, the stuckiest artists is, um, I don't know to what extent, but um, he certainly stands out as being, well, he, he dresses in quite a feminine way. Um, sometimes in a goth way, and he's always worked in a garage. <laughs> and it's okay, you know, he, it's okay. It's, so people accept him, mm. and that's what should happen. Yeah, I mean, but there are ways of addressing things that are best for everybody, rather than just a small group who want to make a point. Because you've got to consider the whole of society. And maybe you've got somebody who is a perfectly viable, and maybe he's very knowledgeable, he's a lecturer or a historian or researcher or, or somebody, maybe as a politician, and people dig up some mistake that person has made, according to them, at some point in their lives, maybe a careless word, and suddenly they, they can't, they're, they're blacklisted. I was not meant to say that probably, I don't know, <laughs> we're not saying blacklisted. They're cancelled. And mm -hmm. I think, well, that's not really tolerant, is it? Because it's like implying you've got to be perfect, mm -hmm. and that is really dangerous, because Psychologically, the only people that are perfect are the people that have got everything denied. And if it's in denial and it's repressed, it's going to come out in the worst possible way. So, and I think the people that are making the most fuss are probably the people that are repressing the most stuff. They've probably got the most issues. And there's a lovely YouTube video I saw yesterday actually. There's this guy who dresses up in a, a Chinese hat. And the, the Chinese robe, and he goes up to white people, I say white, you know, Western people, they were, I think, all white people, and maybe as the odd black person as well, he went up to him and said, you know, what do you think of my costume? And they said, it's appropriation, it's disgusting, you know, you've got no right to wear it, I'm appalled, etc, etc. And then he went up to Chinese people, and they're going, it's lovely, how nice you're wearing our costume, we'd like to see it, we'd like to see it more. Mm -hmm. 
He did the same thing with a Mexican hat and a you know Mexican poncho, mm -hmm. and all the people he goes up, all the Westerners, all the kind of I don't know, they don't not even particularly woke people or anything. I don't think they're just just like ordinary Westerners. They tend to be on the younger side. And they're just saying the same thing. You've got no right to wear it. You're just, you know, appropriating, you know, demeaning somebody else's costume. Mm. He goes up to the Mexican people and they're going, yeah, <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> brilliant, love the hat, looks really good on you. Mm. Um, and I think there's probably an awful lot of that, an mm. awful lot of that. And I don't like it at all. And I have written poems about it, which haven't got on me, fortunately. That means I won't have to read them out. I don't know, quite ready to release them yet, but... You know, there needs to be a counter movement. Just as actually stuck in with stuckism was an artistic counter movement to bullshit, to pretentiousness, to manipulation of the whole art world. Mm. Which to a certain extent doesn't really matter because no one gives a shit about the art world, apart from the people involved in it. But it does deprive the rest of society of an art which would be more meaningful to them. And there's proof of that. I mean, when Rachel White Reed had an exhibition of her stuff at Tate Modern, no, sorry, Tate Britain, years ago, and what does she do? She does casts of things. She does a cast underneath a chair, which is actually taken from Jeff Coons anyway, doesn't matter. And then she'll make a solid block out of what was a space under a chair and she, she did this with a room so she did a cast inside the room so normally obviously the walls are solid and the inside is a space well when she did it the inside was solid concrete and the walls were just shown they weren't there they were shown by indentations and pardon me she did an exhibition at Tate Britain and it was had so little attention they had to give away tickets if you went to another exhibition that was on at the same time, you got a free ticket to hers because it was so embarrassing because nobody was interested in it. Um, now, we had an exhibition, as I've mentioned, of the Stuckis at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool in 2004 called the Stuckis Pump Victorian, and it was a massive exhibition. It was meant to be two months, it ran for five. And they had big, this was a big old gallery, very high walls, and we had paintings floor to ceiling all around this. It was like walking into a cathedral of art. And they said it was really popular. They said all sorts of people, got students, school children, tourists, artists, you know, collectors, critics, um, just townspeople. People were coming, they were loving it because it, it meant something to them. I mean, there's a John Bourne painting, for example, of a family, and I think they're standing there, maybe four people, and there's a father-looking figure with a cup of tea, and, and people, somebody was saying, well, I wonder why he's got a cup of tea and no one else. So, they want, the people promoting conceptual art, for example, their big banner is, oh, it makes people think, it makes people question. It does, but the thing, what it makes people question is why the fuck it's there in the first place. They say, why are you calling it art? They're not questioning anything about life, they're just questioning the people that are doing it. You know, why should we think anything of this? It doesn't mean anything to me, I'm not getting anything from it. Why is it so good? What's good about it? Whereas when they're coming to the Stuckett show, they're actually engaging in a dialogue through the painting about things which mattered in their own lives. It's like, well yeah, I mean I'm making this up, but it's like, yeah, my dad always gets his cup of tea, doesn't he? He doesn't make me one, it's that sort of thing, you know. And it, that's just one example, because obviously there's a whole load of different approaches to life in Stuckey's work, because it's so varied stylistically and subject-wise. But the one thing that's in common is it is actually dealing with something, and in a way that people can relate to. You know, anything here, I think there's really nothing here at all that you couldn't look at and have a response that would mean something to you. Obviously some would mean more. Obviously, if you like funny looking cats or kind of 18th century figures or or um, this one here, like a donkey and, and a woman, you know, if you like that kind of sensitivity or someone that's looking a little bit more 
like sort of street cred, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, you'd relate to different ones, but you could still relate to everything here, or just like the man and the woman, you know, what are they doing? Why has he got this attitude towards her? Why does he look as though there's some little tension there? And obviously tension in relationships is something that most people can relate to. Or even just that one with, with objects in the kitchen. Um, you know, it maybe reminds you of your kitchen. And you think, yeah, you know, I like my kitchen. I've got things in there. I like my mug. I like my, you know, a nice bottle of wine or a saucepan. I you know, enjoy it. I cook the meal. And mm. it's kind of nice to see it. And it's kind of refreshing. It's the colours are upbeat. They're not depressing. And it's, it's kind of nice thing to look at. And that brings me to why I paint and I realised this in 2001 because I asked myself why do I do it and I was living in West Finchley and in my living room was a white wall and on it was a painting and I thought I know why I paint because I'd rather see that painting there than a blank white wall I'd rather this thing that I've created with existing rather than nothing existing because I feel better and it seems to me that's a very good reason. In fact, it seems to me it's the only reason really for art. I mean, if you don't, or poetry or anything, you know, it's not a religion, it's not a duty. Some things are a duty, right? Some things you, maybe, you, I mean, I get a bit bored cleaning my teeth every day, but you have to do it. Or maybe you have to do something for your parents or for someone that's ill, and you think, oh, you know, I don't really don't want to go down the pharmacy, but they need some, you know, they've got a horrible headache or... You know, it's that time of the month and they have run out of bloody tampons or sanitary towels and I know I've been commissioned to go and buy them. Why me? I'm a man, you know. <laughs> but, oh, you know, I have to really feel awful. I've got horrible. Okay, don't worry, I'll, I'll go, you know. Bloody hell, I'll go. You do things that you don't always want to do. But you don't have to do art. You don't have to do poetry or anything like that. So why do you do it? And I would say because it enhances life. Now, One's got to be very precise and careful about that definition of enhances. I don't necessarily mean it's going to make you feel happy, clappy. I mean, Leonard Cohen said, seriousness is deeply agreeable to the heart. And what I'm saying is it makes your life better. That, well, that might well mean that actually it takes you to a more serious or even a sad part of yourself. Because being in touch with feelings, with emotions, are you running out of battery in your game? No, can I just try something? Yeah. I've got the word Zoom written on my camera, I don't know why, hang on. That's probably because you've zoomed in. Yeah, sorry, no, the, the camera's fine. Oh, um, so what I was saying was that one of the most important things in human psychology is to be in touch with your emotions and feelings, and one of the easiest things to do which one is encouraged to do from babyhood onward is to deny and repress feelings, which is unhealthy. I, I sometimes went into school, I went into a lot of schools to do poetry, which is really a place where you release what you really feel. And I said to a teacher, well, you, you teach children to, their feelings aren't important, to deny their feelings. They said, oh, no, no, of course we don't, of course we resent feelings. I say, okay, fine. So you've got a, a, a La Masse lesson, and the child says, oh, I don't feel like doing it. So you say, oh, that's all right, I respect your feelings. So you don't say that. You say, it doesn't matter what you feel, you're going to do it. This is the lesson. And, they, and the, sort of the penny dropped. Oh, kind of, yes, we do. We tell them that their feelings, the feelings aren't the most important thing. Mm. And yet the feelings are, people think feelings are wild and crazy. Well, if you do that to them, they are. Mm. But actually, if they're well functioning properly, they're very, it's a rational hierarchical system, just as thought is. Because in thought you prioritise and you give value. Well, you do that with feelings. You know, there's something that you have a strong feeling about, something you have an adverse feeling about, a negative feeling about. You give a whole structure. You could look around anything. I mean, I could look at all these paintings just to take this example, and I have a feeling about each of them. Well, to me, oh, that's not as important. It's a bit more superficial, you know? And there's another one that's a bit deeper. Or anything, people that you know, you know, you have feelings about them all, and you give them... <laughs> if you were to actually print out those feelings in a graph, you'd have some people at the top, oh, a massive feeling towards those people. That person 
in a negative feeling, put them in that, you know, they just sort them, sort them all out. So feelings are very important. And one thing that art can do is take you to deeper feelings that you might have lost touch with. And if you don't do that, if you don't learn and manage to be in touch with your feelings, some people are naturally, some people are complete opposite, they're very an opposite, and often, I mean, Jung made a model of the fire and water, basically that air is opposite to water, thought is opposite to feeling. So the people, highly developed thinkers, often have very immature feelings, and you can see that like that uh, film with um, Arlene Dietrich in where the professor is smitten with the, the showgirl, completely, you know, loses everything. And you often see this, you know, people that are supposedly very rational, when their feelings emerge, they go to pieces. And it's like when you see a policeman or a fireman and something, you know, they're tough people, and then maybe they find a dead child in an accident or something and they break down because suddenly the barrier has been smashed. It took something strong to do it, but when it smashes, the feelings just pour out and they're uncontrollable. Whereas somebody else that's more in touch with their feelings, you know, would, would be able to accommodate that experience. They would register it, yeah, sure, as, as well for what it was, appropriately, but there's kind of disproportionate feelings and there's proportionate and appropriate feelings. And if you're healthy, you have integrated and, and appropriate feelings to a situation. So yeah, I mean, certain things are going to make you feel angry, certain things are going to make you feel bad. Um, in proportion to what's going on. Whereas if something's repressed, when it's triggered off, it can just blow up completely because the person hasn't, doesn't know how to deal with it. You know, it's like you have to learn to walk and to run. Well, some people have to learn to work with feelings. We all have to learn to work with feelings. Um, whereas it can be the other way around. Some people are very uh, adapt with their emotions, they're comfortable with their emotions. When it comes to thinking, they, they're kind of really intimidated and you know, they're frightened of sort of thoughts, actually frightened of certain thoughts. They don't know how to handle the thoughts. That's the other way around, so that can happen as well. So, when I say that painting should make you feel better, it should enhance your life, I mean it should bring you to a better engagement with reality. And that's one of the um, points of stuckism, is truth. We, Billy and I sat down and we talked about it and we tried to work out, well, what is spirituality? How does it work? And we, we thought, well, actually, the key to it is truth. Which doesn't mean necessarily not telling lies. It doesn't mean that. Um, it means facing the truth in yourself and knowing what that truth is at all levels. So there's a material truth. For example, it might be that the fridge needs cleaning out. That's a material truth. And maybe there's a, an emotional truth. It's like, I'm not happy with the relationship, you know, but I keep on bottling it up, I keep on denying it. Well, you need to accept that you're not happy with it instead of pretending you are, because things don't work if you pretend something different to truth. And you can take that all the way up to spiritual truth, whatever you might define that as, but to metaphysical truth, you know, to, to things that are beyond meaning of life, you know, for meanings, for example, of why you're doing something. You've got to try and face the truth of that. And might, maybe you decide, actually, you might think, I'm not, my life I'm, I, isn't meaningful. I'm doing something which is not meaningful which doesn't satisfy me, in, there's something wrong in my head with what I'm doing, I can't square it. You know. So that makes things difficult because any time you question something and it, there's an objection to it, obviously it, it upsets the status quo. But when you work through that, the end result is beneficial. So this all comes into it, into our thinking. And I think that... Um, one thing that's clear is that before you have art, you have an artist, and whatever that artist is will translate into the art. So you can't have a superficial person making profound and meaningful art. 
You can have someone who appears to be superficial, but inside they're not. But whatever that person is, is going to translate into the art. And some, some art you can, just to some people, you, I mean, art is a conversation, it's a presentation, it's a communication between the artist and the viewer. It's just as any interaction does that, so that you meet with somebody. And I've found this that sometimes, or maybe I've been emotionally upset for some reason, you know, particularly in you know, youth, when I was younger, I didn't know how to handle things as well. And I talked to somebody and then I'd feel worse. And I talked to somebody else and I'd feel everything was okay. And that person embodied something. They, they embody something. Well, the same thing in art. What they embody will go into the art. So some mm. art will make you feel life is futile. And I must say, that was my experience with the Sensation exhibition at the Royal Academy of the YBAs, the young British artist, Damien Hurst and so on. When I first went in, I thought this is quite exciting, novelty, big, all these exciting different things. But the third time I went to the show, it's like, this is awful. This is like nothing. This is like, it's not enhancing my life, it's depleting my life. It's superficial, it's masquerading as meaning, when it's actually not meaning anything particularly. It doesn't have the soul in it, whatever you might call the soul, what I'm saying, the soul is someone's emotional depth. Um, and again, this is part of the thinking that's fed into stuckism. And I'm not saying all my work embodies, you know, the ideal, because actually ideals are not good things to embody anyway. But I think some of that that I've experienced in life will come through in, in some of the work. I mean, for example, that one. You know, there's something that can translate from that into life as people experience it, into relationship as people experience it. It's not an idea, it's not like a um, caricature of it, even though it's slightly caricatured you know, stylistically, but it's not emotionally. Um, and even anything you do, it's like Van Gogh could paint a chair or a boot, and you feel that that's symbolic of some vibrancy, some power in life that animates existence, all of existence, even a chair or a boot. Right, any questions? <laughs> well, no, but um, well, just things that were occurring to me as you were talking was I was thinking of what I consider good or bad in anything I see, whether it's art or music. And then I said, well, if it looks like the truth, then I'll like it. Even it, like, for example, um, Bob Marley. I don't really like his music, but I watch his videos all the time because it looks like somebody who's just doing their thing. It looks like the tr it looks sincere. It looks like the truth. And that is essentially the, differenti the differentiator between good and bad in art, if you get, if you go as deep as you can. I think with your work, um, what, whatever it is, you, it's, uh, it's, it's a truth, you know, because we, we know, um, well, I, so you said Van Gogh, and Van Gogh said anything done in love is done well. If you, if you can see the essential core of it is good, then the rest it is almost superficial. So, so that, that was just a thought that came to me while you were talking. Um, but no, um, I, I mean, we didn't mention, I mean, I covered these actually, that's my set list, I'll take that down, sorry. Um, th those are a couple of paintings that um, Charles and I did back in the day um, as collaborations. Yes, I, I, I think about the only collaborations I've ever done in my life. Right. Well, in artistic terms. Mm. And I think you should take some credit here for these ones you did at Print Club, because this is a... This is a method you sort of came up with. Was it out of ignorance of not knowing how to make prints that you came up with this Every, method? Everything I did at the print club was out of ignorance, um, which is kind of good because, I don't know, I just tried to, th I mean, I had done some prints at art college, you know, some litho or an etching and silkscreen, but 
those facilities weren't available and everything was very makeshift you know, here in this room. Um, and I thought, well, it'd be quite interesting to try and make up some methods of making prints with some information from you about how some of the things might work. But then, you know, I thought, well, I'd, that's give me an idea to do something else, which I did. I mean, the first prints I did, I just painted on a bit of paper, squashed another bit of paper and pulled it off, then painted the same colours in the same place and put another bit of paper and put another... So it's a bit crude, but, you know, it's a, you've got to start somewhere. That's, I think a lot of people have a problem with failing. <laughs> um, they think they, you know, and our society encourages that. It shows people up, it ridicules people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you say, oh, I don't know what that word means. I mean, I didn't know what the word marinade, marinade means. Which Jasmine's never let me forget. Well, I don't know much about cooking. I know now it means to throw a pancake out the window. No, it doesn't mean that. Um, no, but she will ask things if she doesn't know. Mm. And I'm pleased to say that there were some, some simple words that you know she didn't know either. But mm. you know, you should, people should ask. I mean. You, you should be encouraged to try something you want to do. Um, Again, yeah. it relates back to stuckism. I, I think that, yeah. that well, uh, specifically for maybe S. P. Howarth and the like, who have found themselves kicked out for asking the wrong question, and it's like, well, no, you're you're doing your thing. Well, you know, just just your artwork isn't de dependent on whether it's relevant to what the world's interested in right now. Your art's something more internal. I mean, you could say if you're not asking the wrong question, you're not getting it right. Hmm. Because, I mean, art, and it's particularly obvious in poetry, for example, um, but also in art, I mean, but it, because poetry is words and dealing with ideas and concepts as well, you can perhaps illustrate it more clearly because we're more of a verbal than visual culture. Um, the reason it's been associated with a lot of controversy, new theory developments, is because it's doing the thing you're not meant to do. Why aren't you meant to do it? because it's in de been denied by mainstream society and it's an unhealthy denial, it's something which needs to be brought forth and we've got a quotes in the Stuckist literature from one of the Gnostic Gospels from Jesus saying if you don't bring things out forth it will destroy you, you know. And the same with society and artists are that safety valve that they express the thing which is basically from the unconscious. That's why it seems new and startling, because it is, because to the conscious mind it's like, oh, I don't know what this is, you know? And some people, of course, a small number of people will connect with it, but most people will be following behind, lagging behind. And it's, it, it's it bringing into consciousness something which is being repressed, which in an unhealthy way. Mm. And um, let's take Wordsworth. I mean, he seems very safe writing about daffodils and country cottages. Well, at the time, and most people don't realise this, he was like the Sex Pistols, he was like the Johnny Rotten. He was writing about vulgar subjects, vulgar things like peasants and cottages that were beneath art. Art should be historic and grand and mythological. I mean, even, yeah, it shouldn't be writing about these people. And he was, and that was shocking. But obviously, it's very, very healthy for society that these things should have a spotlight shone on them. And then it gets integrated in the mainstream. That's just one example. Um, you know, Byron's another classic example of someone that was kind of shocking because he pointed out things which um, were not normally pointed out, but which needed to be. There needed to be a freer discourse about things mm -hmm. which he was writing about. And you can just see that going throughout. Um, I can't remember how we got onto this from the prints. <laughs> no, but Stuckism has um, been documenting a lot of stuff that has, would otherwise have gone undocumented were, were it not for Stuckism. This kind of idea that painting is dead, painting's a medium of yesterday. Well, that's not what actually is happening. 
So I'm, I'm always trying to tie it back to stuckism, obviously. But oh, I see. Right, I didn't realise that. I can do that. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's just um, what what you were saying about something that was different is an example example of what stuckism has done as well. Course, just I that mean, aspect of I mean, going from the truth. I mean, Peter Doorhaker was always recognised as a painter, even though throughout the periods when painting was actually dead, you've just still got people like Francis Bacon and Lucian Freud, and we're all recognised. Um, Leaving Peter Doig out of it, but the other people I've mentioned basically had a nihilistic philosophy, mm. and that was an acceptable approach to art, nihilism. Yes, yeah, so even within within painting, as long as you tick one of those boxes, then you'll get through. But like say, stuckism is is not really like that. You wouldn't necessarily get you know your John Bournes or, or what have you. No. You know because they don't have some sort of. On a, on a very shallow level, something that you can say, yeah, this separates him from the bunch. Um, and you could say there's a certain... I mean, it's interesting because there's a connection with Peter Doy because Billy Childish was at London Art College with him and they've become friends and, you know, so on. Mm. So there's this kind of a connection and um, there's a certain overlap. But he, from what I know, certainly in some of his best-known works, tended to use uh, photography. And it was like a comment on photography, as much as anything else, which makes it kind of clever. You're not just interested in the subject. Mm. Um, you're doing this kind of comment on different means of visual record. Mm. Um, anyway, what, you wanted to talk about prints and... Um... Not necessarily. I mean, like, like I said, just say that there's two in the show. Um, well, that's, How... that's the example of it. Yeah. No, I developed, I know, I, it was, well, I suppose, yeah, I mean, I was starting off like a toddler printing, and I, I was learning, and I uh, getting some input from you, and then, um, what's the word, I can't even think of the word now, um, you know, innovating, creating, inventing. Hmm different other ways of doing it and I developed this way which we called, I think it was called offset printing wasn't it or something? Offset mono print I think, I can't remember now. But it produced some very interesting results. Uh, that's one of them up there but uh, I think the, I won't go into that, it's a trade secret. Okay. At the moment. Is there anything about, because I know in the, in, the, in the manifesto you say about the, the experience of seeing works up in homes as opposed to just viewing them you know, do you feel any of that at this show that there's a there's an experience that you wouldn't get if it was maybe in Tate Modern, that just just from the environmental fact of it? No, oh, definitely. Right. Do you feel it's? A, 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 I don't know. I don't want to put any words into your mouth. No, feel free. I'll deny them if I don't okay. like them. I'll just tell you they're wrong. But you know, why not go for it? Well, yeah. Well, just just contrast sort of how how you might experience the paintings here because I know that we've all done shows in you know your typical white wall gallery I've, I've done them you've done them and it is a very different experience um maybe maybe in good ways some ways and maybe in bad ways other ways but I was just wondering how how you experience the, the contrast well and strangely enough most of the shows that I've done and curated as time went on even more so in spaces with white walls Although I would like to point out I had a stuckism gallery for three years from 2002 which had maroon um, upstairs and deep green downstairs so it wasn't a white wall gallery. And but it was your home as well with yeah, sofas and all that lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but uh -huh. anyway, um, <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say now. Oh, oh just yeah, yeah. the experience. Now, what I was going to say was I am basically curating shows as if I am doing it at home because my interest in creating them was to see the art. Like, it wasn't to sell the work, because generally speaking that didn't really happen very much. Because by the time I had organised the show, I had completely run out of steam for doing commercial stuff, which never really interested me. What I liked was seeing the work and also bringing people together, enabling them to see their work being displayed and having attention, because that's very encouraging for artists, and to to see their colleagues, other stuckists, and, and it was part of a communal effort. And that was my interest. And 
so you could say it was effectively rather like what you've done here. I was doing it on a similar basis. Mm. I wasn't thinking, oh right, you know, the world's press. Well, to start with, there was more of that going on. But as time went on, it lessened about you know, the world's press beating their way to the, the show. They didn't end up doing that very much. And as I say, mm. I'd run out of steam, and by then I was sort of mm, a bit of a one-man band. Because when we started out in Gallery 108 in uh, 1999, Joe Crompton was the gallerist. Billy and I were both there. He had his contacts. I was getting contacting people in the press. And when you've got a small number of people working together doing something, it's much easier. But it, it, uh, eventually I was really doing everything. Well, I wasn't necessarily sitting there manning the, you know, so you, I think you did some invigilation. But I was doing all the organising. Um, mm. And that's it. I mean, that, that, I had enthusiasm for doing the organising of the work. But I never really enjoyed promoting stuff to the press and doing PR and all that stuff. Even mm. I've done an awful lot of it quite successfully. Uh, just because you can do something and you can do it well and you can do it successfully, it doesn't mean it's what you want to do or even what you should carry on doing. It was a means to an end. Mm. If stuckism and the art could be promoted without me having to do all of that, I would just click my fingers and say, great. But it mm. couldn't. It wouldn't have been. We wouldn't even be here in this room, this small show where I'm the only visitor to date. Mm. I think Don Takashita Guy is threatening to come along. We wouldn't even have this had it not been for all that press promotion. Mm. But you want to talk about stuckism. See, for me, I'm kind of jaded with talking about stuckism because I've been doing it for 22 years. Um, and you get fed up saying the same thing. I mean, I used to work on a hospital switchboard. I was on there seven years part time and I calculated in the end I set up Thalwick Hospital a quarter of a million times. But eventually, when I walked away from work, all my limbs were aching. And as soon as I left the job, all the ache went. I mean, I, you know. Mm. So, so, so I, I've learned to recognise that now. I, I've got no control over it. I mean, I was, went to art college, obviously, and then I got into, I gave up art, got into poetry, I was doing children's poetry, I was going to schools, I was earning a lot of money, really good money, going, I went to 700 schools in 13 years, but at the end of it, it was just like a money machine. And I thought, this is not why I'm doing poetry. And I was jaded, I was fed up with it. And I was very successful, I mean, you know, in over a hundred anthologists for children from Penguin and Oxford Press and all I was, you know, doing really well. And I got back into painting and I had to give up the children's poetry, even though I was doing really well in it, because I couldn't do both at the same time. Because, you know, doing the children's poetry, I mean, you get an editor getting in touch saying, oh, I'm doing a, a book on ghosts for nine to eleven year olds and you have to sit there writing, you know, half a dozen or ten poems. Well, that takes time and energy. And I needed that time and energy for doing painting or promoting stuckism or whatever. So mm. I just eased my way. It's a bit, of, you know, it's like sad. It's like a withdrawal symptom. I had to ease my way out of it. And I stopped doing it. And I haven't done any children's poetry for the last 20 years. In fact, I didn't do any adult poetry because before when I was doing children's poetry, I, I squeezed out all the adult poetry as well. And then after 20 years, and this happened about three years ago, suddenly you know, the, the tsunami happened inside. You know, the, the dam broke and I, I wrote about 400 poems in a year and a half. Mm. wrote as many in 18 months as I've written in 18 years. And they're the best ones I've written. Um, you tend to paint like that a bit, don't you? You just have a, 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 an avalanche of paintings, then a long period of nothing, and then another avalanche of paintings. Yeah, phases mm. of things. Because I suppose, yeah, when I was, um, I'll, I'll illustrate it with the poetry, but it applies to the painting as well. When I was doing this big outburst of poems about three years ago, I put everything I could to one side because one came after another, after another. I'd opened up, and now I, the tap, and I, I've had to switch the tap off. I could open it again, and, and more poems would come out, but I've got to do other stuff. So when I went through a change in my painting in 2013, I think it was, um, I put everything to one side and some very interesting opportunities came up. You know, I knew things came up, like a couple of times things came up and I thought this could make a story, this could get in the national press. And I thought I can't do it because I've got to do the painting. You know, if I get involved with that, I won't be doing the painting. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the trouble is when you're multifunctional, when you're doing all sorts of things, not just doing the painting, you know, you're doing the, the PR, you're doing the press, you're doing the curating, you, you know, you're, you're doing the timetables, you're sending out the emails, you're doing all the secretarial and administrative stuff. When you're doing the whole lot, um, it takes over, you know, it blocks everything out. And so in order to do painting, I had to blot all that out not do any of it and it worked so yeah I mean what's really awkward and difficult is recently I've had to do some commission work and I'm not in a painting phase <laughs> so some of it's taken ten times as long as it should because I haven't got it right because I'm not really kind of quite in that zone mm. um, and also I've sort of defaulted back to an earlier style war, which takes loads of time, which I didn't want to do. So I, I would say, if you like, I've got it a bit wrong in what I've done. And the paintings are good, you know, I mean, I'm doing a good job on them, but for me, artistically, that's not what I want to do. And next time I will do it differently. Because mm. I, I will know what the mistake is. And that's another interesting thing in life, is often you have to make the mistake hmm. to know what it is. Hmm. You have to get it wrong to learn why it's wrong. Because oh, otherwise yeah. you won't know it's wrong. And obviously you didn't know it was wrong, you wouldn't have done it. <laughs> and the fruits of all your wrong labour will have their own value anyway, so you can't go wrong really, can you, whatever you well, do? Well, that's something else as well, because nothing's wasted. Hmm. You know, I do believe that. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking of bringing out a, a book called Failed Relationships, a poem called Failed Relationships. Because, well, you could say in conventional, well, most people's relationships have failed, aren't they, in conventional terms, because your people don't stick together. I mean, you're meant to be, and actually people that do stick together, sometimes their relationships aren't very good anyway. So is that a failed relationship? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could say my parents stuck together their whole lives. Um, probably 60 years, but there was some stuff underneath the surface, there was tensions, there was issues, you know? So is that successful or, or failed? No? I mean, these are just values you put on things. Mm. I mean, to me, everything's an experience. And I've, I've talked to somebody about that recently. What they said, they said, oh, I've mucked up my life. And I said, no, you haven't, because, you, you know, you've, through doing this you've got an awful lot of depth of experience and knowledge and insight into mm. various things that you wouldn't have had if you had just had a superficial easy life. I said you haven't mucked it up at all. You did what you could at the time. Mm. And now actually you've left that behind and you're in a different phase. You're suddenly you're free from that. But what you're now thinking of doing with some creative work, writing or whatever, you're actually talking about using that material. So obviously it's not wasted. Yeah. I mean there's a lot of things that Simple things that society should change.